Good afternoon and welcome to the 20th annual lecture in honor of Sidney J. Friedberg. Uh, I'm David Brown, curator of Italian paintings at the gallery, and it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon Patricia Fortini Brown, another Brown, a professor emerita at Princeton University, where she taught in the Department of Art and Archaeology from 1983 to 2010. Uh, she was an outstanding teacher, and uh, I know that a number of her students are here today. Uh, before continuing with the introduction, I'd like to say a word or two about the series. Uh, when Sidney Friedberg uh, passed away on, uh, in November 1997, uh, I uh, got together with several colleagues here at the gallery and with Catherine Friedberg, and uh, we wanted to uh, do something in his honor that would uh, uh, celebrate his life and work. Uh, and we explored various possibilities. One was uh, a work of art with a label that bore his name. Another one was a rare book. And then we got the idea of a lecture series. And uh, this uh, seems to have been exactly right, because while it began as an experiment, uh, uh, soon enough, it was so successful uh, that uh, Catherine Friedberg uh, gracefully and generously agreed to endow the series. Uh, so that, as I'm fond of saying without wanting to sound too apocalyptic, as long as there's a National Gallery, there will be a Friedberg lecture. <laughs> Now, um, Pat Brown, as I'll call her, uh, has many honors. She was Slade Professor at the University of Cambridge in England, and she served as president of the Renaissance Society of America. She was a recipient of the British Academy Serena Medal for Italian Studies, and she's held a number of prestigious fellowships, including a Guggenheim. And she presently serves on the board of say, Venice. Uh, she has written and lectured uh, extensively on the art history of medieval and Renaissance Venice. And uh, I'd like to say a word or two about her um, uh, publications. Uh, they uh, strike me as being more like publications in the scientific field because um, in that field, uh, a, the worth of a paper is, is um, measured by the number of citations it gets. And I have to say that uh, uh, Patricia Fortini Brown has received uh, more and more complimentary reviews for the books she's published than any other scholar I know. She's had a huge impact on the field uh, her books, uh, the first in the series, was uh, Venetian Narrative Painting in the Age of Carpaccio, 1988, Venice and Antiquity, The Venetian Sense of the Past in 1996, Art and Life in Renaissance Venice, and then Private Lives in Renaissance Venice, Art, Architecture, and the Family in 2004. She's now working on a book entitled The Venetian Bride, uh, which promises to be a story of vendetta and intrigue, exile and redemption. That sounds like a winner. <laughs> uh, I would like to say uh, too that um, um, given her topic and knowing ahead about her lecture, when I was recently in Venice, uh, for the first time I uh, looked around and noticed the wells everywhere. I had been looking at great paintings and architecture like most visitors to Venice without realizing that every courtyard and every square has a well, which was of course uh, absolutely vital to the survival of Venice because it provided uh, fresh water to a city uh, that was immersed in water. Well. <coughs> Uh, Pat Brown's title this afternoon isn't appropriately The Aesthetics of Water, Wellheads, 
cisterns, and fountains in the Venetian dominion. Uh, finally, I'd like to say there was a recent complaint that art history has abandoned, I'm quoting here, any idea of elucidating the story of art in a humane and cogent way. Pat Brown is here to prove the contrary. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I wasn't nervous until this very minute. <laughs> I would like to thank the National Gallery of Art and the Lecture Committee uh, for the, and, and Catherine Friedberg for this opportunity to honor Sidney Friedberg. Although much of his scholarship focused on painting in Rome and Florence, Venice was never far from his heart. He was a founding member in 1971 of Save Venice, a committee that's still dedicated, 45 years later, to preserving the cultural patrimony of the city. And I like to imagine Professor Friedberg at our sides as we wander through the Cali and Campi of Venice today, revisiting the humble wellheads that he would have known, loved, and appreciated. When we think of Venice, we think of water, a city in the sea, a group of islands surrounded by water. And yet therein lies a paradox. As the Venetian diarist Marine Sunudo once wrote, Venice is in the water and has no water. No rivers, no springs, no source of fresh water other, other than the rain from heaven or barges from the mainland. Sunudo remarked further, and it is truly a joke, living in the water and having to buy it. Were it possible to make fountains here, I think that no city in the world would equal Venice. Indeed, Canaletto's painting on view in Gallery 31 shows a main piazza without a fountain, unusual in that period. In fact, treatises on and imaginary images of the ideal city envisioned a fountain as the focus of the city center. But the Venetians had to build a city without running water, and they learned early on how to capture this precious natural resource. Since the groundwater was not drinkable and there were no artesian springs, they could not drill proper wells. So they devised an ingenious system of water recovery that's hidden be beneath almost every campo, cloister, and courtyard in the city. First, a basin around four meters deep would be scooped out of the island mud. Then the basin was lined with a thick layer of clay that kept out the salt water. A stone slab was placed in the center, and a well shaft of brick or stone, perforated at the bottom, was set upon it. The clay basin was then filled with layers of sand and topped with paving stones or bricks. Rainwater was channeled from roof gutters through downspouts or fell directly onto the squares, where it trickled into drains embedded on the sides and percolated down through the sand into the cistern at the bottom of the wellhead and the filtered water was then pulled up to the surface in buckets. And what we see is this. The well shaft with the cistern under the pavement is called a pozzo, and the receptacle on top, a vera da pozzo, but we'll stick with the English term wellhead instead. During periods of drought, when insufficient rain fell to meet the city's needs, water workers called aquaroli, would row large fat, flat bottom barges to Lisa Fusina at the edge of the lagoon. There they loaded potable water from the Brenta River into their barges by means of a water wheel, a ge geared mechanism that gives meaning to the term horsepower. <laughs> Returning to Venice with their barges filled with fresh water, the Aquaroli made their rounds to the wells throughout the city and poured the water into the cisterns or sold it directly. The purity of the public cisterns was protected by the authorities. As shown in Canaletto's painting, the wells had wooden or metal covers, locked at night and opened every morning by the parish priest or his representative at the ringing of the church bells. Water was also sold in small quantities along the streets by water sellers called bigolanti, who brought fresh water directly to homes and shops upon request. Now let's, let's turn to the wellhead, our first business at hand. Here we see where necessity provided an opportunity for self-expression and civic beautification. 
As the inscription on the wellhead in Campo San, Le San Leonardo states, for the convenience of the people as well as an ornament to the city. In sum, utility and aesthetics. The wellhead was a place of encounter, and as such, it was arguably the most important piece of sculpture in the everyday life of Venetians. Not only a place to fetch water, but also to socialize with the neighbors. As we walk through the winding streets of Venice, we still encounter an astonishing variety of wellheads, one after another, centerpieces of nearly every pub public compo and private courtyard. During the Renaissance, there were around 7,000 of them. Since Venice had no stone of its own, all the wellhead material, primarily uh, marble or limestone, had to be boated in from elsewhere. Venetians were masters at repurposing antique remains, and early on, the archaeological wellhead was made from genuine Roman or Greek spolia. The hollowed out shaft of a Corinthian column, probably brought in from the mainland near Aquileia, once capped a cistern in, the front of the, in front of the church of Santa Fosca on Torcello. Two more, now in the Museo Archeologico, were probably spoils from the Fourth Crusade, when Venice joined the French in capturing and looting Constantinople. One, this one here, fashioned from a Corinthian capital of Proconesian marble, and the other, crafted from a handsome votive altar, decorated with Lucrania, rosettes and swags, and bearing a Greek inscription. Most of these wellheads carved, most of the wellheads carved ex novo from blocks of stone were less elaborate. Indeed, some were very plain, strictly to supply water, like the generic wellhead in Corte del Milion, where Marco Polo is thought to have lived. But now let's go back to the beginning and look at the development of wellheads over time. The earliest surviving purpose-made wellheads are hollowed out cubes or cylinders of marble or limestone and date to the 8th to the 10th century. This is usually sometimes called the Carolingian period, when Venice fought off the Frankish kings and embraced Byzantium. One of the most common decorative motifs was a large cross flanked by stylized leaves and set beneath an arch, an ensemble called the Life-Giving Cross in Byzantine texts. It's been suggested that these crosses were apotropaic, kind of magical, ensuring the purity of the water in the cistern and the health of those who drank it. And beyond that, that they had political resonance, link linking Venice's salvation to the, to the Byzantine Empire. Indeed, the interlaced pattern with flowers and rosettes on the left-hand side of the v and wellhead is strikingly similar to that on the Palastri Acritani, looted from Constantinople after 1204. By the 12th century, during the Romanesque period, the wellheads featured an amalgam of Western, Byzantine, and Islamic elements. This example combines the cubic and cylindrical shapes of the earlier period by enclosing a drum within a framework of arches supported by columns. The animal and vegetal motifs on the drum are similar to the Veneto-Byzantine formelle that one still sees embedded high on walls of Venetian palaces. Indeed, the style and iconography of wellheads was often reflected in architectural sculpture in Venice at large. As with the arches shared by this wellhead and Kabarzitsa on the Grand Canal. By the 13th century, the pointed Gothic arch was beginning to replace the round headed Byzantine, and we see both in the slightly inflected Gothic arches tucked inside a round headed arcade on this square uh, wellhead in Campiello del Remer. The Gothic arches replicate the windows of the Piano Nobile of Ca Leone Morosini behind it. In the 14th century, a shape that melded circle and square emerged to become the most common type. It consists of a slightly tapered cylindrical drum topped off by a squared off cornice with hanging arches on each side and scooped out corners. We see it in every sestiere in Venice, but with subtle differences. In Calle del Tomasi in San Polo with extended archivolts, in Corte Bolani in Castello with shallow archivolts, 
repurposed as a table at Hotel Al Ponte Mocenigo in Santa Croce. In Campo San Sebastiano in Dorso Duro with Islamic archivolts. In Corte Mazor in Dorso Duro with rosettes all around. In the ghetto in Cantareggio and in Corte Canal in Dorso Duro with a rosette and a coat of arms on the sides. And in Campo San Vidal, still in exactly the same place that Canaletto recorded it in the 18th century. Canaletto's painting is doubly revealing, for it shows us the wellhead in use, as well as the stonemason's yard in which it could well have been made. For those of you familiar with Venice, the present, uh, present Academia Bridge now spans the Grand Canal right about here. The mason's yard is long gone. Coats of arms and um, fori were probably the most common decorative motifs on wellheads, whatever their shape, throughout the period. Here's an assortment, one from each sestiere of the city from the 13th to the 15th century. The most elaborate and original wellheads were usually hidden away in the private courtyards of palaces. The human figure and coats of arms, often with personalized imagery that celebrated the family, began to appear on wellheads in the 14th century. A circle of courtly figures, five maidens, four youths, dance hand in hand around this drum-shaped example. The wellhead on the top, decorated with the heads of young children, alternating with plumes of foliage, once stood in the courtyard of the house of the painter Jacopo Tintoretto in Conoreggio the one on the bottom in Capesero degli Orfei. And both were modeled after one of the capitals of the arcade of the south facade of the Palazzo Ducale. Around the end of the 14th century, the Corinthian capital became a favored model for the wellheads. The courtyard of Cadoro is dominated by a magnificent piece carved in red Verona marble by Bartolomeo Bone in the 1420s. This is one of the very few wellheads that can be attributed to a specific sculptor and is recorded as, uh, recorded as having taken 233 days to carve. With one face featuring the Contarini coat of arms, the other three sides are carved with personifications of fortitude, justice, and charity, the most cherished uh, virtues of the Venetian family and the state. With this remarkable wellhead, moved from private to public space at some point, uh, in Campo San Giovanni Grisostomo, we see a transitional style, also inspired, inspired by the Corinthian capital. It features lion's head protomes on the corners, referring, of course, to St. Mark, and swags of fruit and foliage, beloved motifs throughout the period. It was graced with a coat of arms, uh, possibly of the noble Cornere family. And some wellheads resist typology, like this unique specimen carved like a basket in Corte Gregolina near Calle de Fabri. 16th century wellheads in public squares tended to be simple geometrical shapes, square, round, or hexagonal. They often feature inscriptions and figures of patron saints. For example, example, the large hexagon decorated with swags of fruit and foliage and a kneeling St. Francis in Campo de Jesuiti. Only one of two original wellheads that gave the name to Campo de do Pozzi, or Campo of the two wellheads, survives. But they are both commemorated by this relief on one of its panels. But there's more. The patrons of this wellhead had a sense of place. San Martino and the Holy Trinity are opposite one another on other panels. This religious duality is explained by the fact that the Campo is located between the parishes of Santa Trinita, Holy Trinity, and San Martino. The iconography of the surviving wellhead thus celebrates the history and geography of the Campo. A new shape for wellheads emerged in the 17th century. Just as the Gothic and Renaissance masons had been inspired by the capitals of columns, the sculptors of the Baroque period were inspired by the baluster, or the balustrade. The two, the two massive wellheads in Canaletto's painting were installed in Campo San Stefano in 1724. 
They're the robust descendants of the balustrade of Palazzo Loredan on the same campo. The empty circle in the wellhead on the right once contained the Lion of St. Mark, neatly chiseled off in the iconoclastic frenzy that swept through the city at the end of the Republic in 1797. But now let's return to the mid-16th century and the two great wellheads in the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducali, recorded by Antonio Gioli in the 18th century. They were cast in costly bronze, the only ones in the city, to replace earlier ones made of stone. And they were anything but plain and simple. Carved in a mannerist style that we associate more with furniture than with architecture per se, and created not by stonemasons, but by bronze casters in foundries that specialized in artillery. One wellhead is proudly signed and dated. God, fortune, work, ingenuity. Niccolo di Conti, son of Marco, Venetian, caster of weapons to the most illustrious Venetian Republic, cast this work, 1556. The other, head, other wellhead is inscribed simply with the date and the name of the family foundry, Albergetti, 1559. Their decorative arsenal features an exuberant assemblage of grotesque masks, winged cherubs, bare-breasted herms, cartouches, volutes, boorish strapwork, scrolls, and swags of fruit. It's sometimes called the Sansovino style after the sculptor Jacopo Sansovino. Almost as if in competition, each artisan sought to outdo the other by skillfully employing this vocabulary in a distinctly different way. We also find it on stuccoed ceiling decoration, or on picture frames, or on book frontispieces, pieces, or on cannons. Where we do not find it is on other wellheads. The bronze wellheads made an unapolog unapologetic statement of magnificence and civic benevolence. For as Jolie attests, they were meant to be used. And yet, notwithstanding their splendor, Venice was still a city without a single fountain of fresh running water. However, it was able to build and appropriate fountains in its larger dominion. So let's go to Bergamo, the city furthest west in Venice's terra firma empire. Francesco Bassano uh, captures the ideal relationship between Venice and its subject cities in his painting of an incoming Venetian podesta, piously receiving the baton of rule and statutes of the city of Bergamo from a queenly Venice. Unlike Venice, Bergamo was an old Roman city with an abundant water supply furnished by springs and rivers. By the 13th century, it had 16 public fountains, one in every neighborhood. These were mostly plain and utilitarian, like the Fontana uh, di Antiscolis, tucked away behind the cathedral. When the Venetians took over in the 15th century, they assumed responsibility for furnishing water to the city. As in Venice with its wellheads, new fountains were seen as opportunities for urban beautification, assuming a decorative as well as practical fun function. And we'll look at just two examples. First, the Fontana del Delfino, situated on Via del Pignolo at a crossroads between the upper and lower cities. According to an early source, it was built in 1572 for public benefit at the expense of the neighborhood quote, for the notable profit of all, end quote. It features a muscular triton astride a dolphin atop a square pedestal decorated with a large pine cone, the emblem of the Borgo del Pignolo, that neighborhood. Water pours into a round basin from the mouths of two masks representing sea divinities. Indeed, many, and curiously, many of the fountains built in Venice's outlying territories featured mythical sea creatures and were probably inspired, inspired by fountain statuary in central Italy. And therein lies another paradox. In Venice, the city in the sea, the wellheads are largely devoid of marine imagery. And now for our second example. Let's move ahead two centuries to 1780, less than two decades before the collapse of the Venetian Empire. The outgoing Podesta, Alvise Contarini, commissioned a new fountain for the Piazza Vecchia, the main square of the upper city. 
Situated in front of the Palazzo della Regione with the Palazzo del Podesta on the right, it is the quintessential statement of the generosity of a prince toward his people. At once ornamental and utilitarian, the sculptural ensemble is a mixture of the political, the mythical, and the personal. In the center, an octagonal basin, on two sides a pair of lions, symbols of the Serenissima, and guardians of public order. On each of the other two sides, a sphinx, flanked by small columns entwined by zoomorphic hybrids, both lion and snake. A slender stream of water sprays from the center of the principal basin and pours from the sphinx's mouths into smaller side basins. It's probably no coincidence that sphinxes also featured, uh, are also featured in Baratti, uh, Baratti's portrait of the patron. While they were part of the decorative vocabulary of the time, their appearance here put a personal stamp on the fountain, or perhaps the other way around. And perhaps a look back at Venice's golden age with a vocabulary reminiscent of the bronze wellheads in the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducale. And it might be noted an amenity that Venice did not have, a civic fountain in the main square. Now let's move on to Brescia a neighbor of Bergamo and another Roman city. Brescia, pictured in a portrait of the Venetian Podesta by a follower of Tintoretto, was known as the city of fountains with abundant water supplied by three rivers and an aqueduct that dated back to Roman times. It had 47 major public fountains by the end of the 16th century, but we'll look at just one, the Fontana della Palata sharing pride of place with the civic loggia in a lower corner of Rashi Chotti's map. The fortified Torre della Palata, built in part from the remains of Roman buildings, stood at a major crossroads of the city. In 1597, a new fountain was built at its base. It was designed like a Baroque pediment, complete with volutes, scrolls, and obelisks that served as a, served as a frame for a sensuous Triton, the fish-tailed sea god and son of Poseidon, blow, or Neptune, blowing water from two conch shell trumpets. Behind him is the coat of arms of the city. At his sides, pilasters decorated with clusters of fruit suspended from leonine corbels. He is flanked by the gods of the city's two principal rivers, the Garza and the Mela. She seashells on the pedestal supporting the obelisks complete the aquatic theme. And sitting like a queen atop the Triton's niche is the figure of Brescia in the armor of Athena, Pallas Athene, holding a cornucopia. During the fountain's construction, a certain ma magister Cesare, called the Fontanaro, inadvertently broke a piece of spolia in the wall above the fountain and took it away. He was obliged by an outraged superintendent of public works to retrieve the stone, repairing and reintegrating it in the wall in a, quote, praiseworthy form at his own expense. The stone in question is not recorded, but this relief of uh, Santa Polonaire, or Santa Polonio, uh, an early Christian bishop who first preached the gospel in Brescia is a plausible candidate. The fountain shown here in a 19th century painting celebrates Brescia's Roman and Christian past and its identity as an independent city, even when under Venetian domination, that provides prosperity and abundant water to its citizens. Ironically, Brescia, the city of fountains with abundant water, unlike Venice, did not have a fountain in the Piazza della Loggia, arguably the most important square of the city. Two artists sought to redress this defect, not of nature but of man, by inserting imaginary fountains in the center of the square in paintings made a century apart. Although accurate in most respects, as far as the architecture is concerned, the paintings fall into the category of the capriccio, a work of art representing a fantasy or a mixture of real and imaginary features. In this case, perhaps examples of wishful thinking. Although most of Venice's terra firma cities were located on rivers or streams and had a stable water supply, the situation was different in Venice's settlements in the Stato di Mar, the Mediterranean. Today, we'll look at two cities. Candia in Crete, and Famagusta in Cyprus. 
On Bertelli's map, Famagusta, Venice's major port in Cyprus, is protected by the Lion of St. Mark on the right. The Venetian John Matteo Bembo served there as Capitano in 1547 to 49 and beautified its main square with two monumental columns found nearby in the ancient Roman settlement of Salamis and a handsome sarcophagus. Bembo also attempted to supply the entire city with running water, but without success. A few years later, the Capitano Piero Navagero was able to obtain a plentiful supply of water from a well just one kilometer away. Using a mechanism similar to the water lifting device employed back in Fusina at the edge of the Venetian lagoon, water was drawn up in clay pots with an it's a, it's a apparatus called an alicati or a Persian wheel and channeled into the city through clay pipes as depicted here by a Venetian traveler in just right about the time that it was, uh, it was uh, the, the uh, uh, Navajero uh, uh, set up this apparatus. Navajero reported to the Venetian Senate in 1558 that he had also constructed a most beautiful fountain of the finest marble in the middle of the piazza for the adornment of the city and the convenience of everyone, inhabitants as well as soldiers. The fountain is long gone from the square, but it's likely, likely this one, moved to the monastery of Ayanapa after the Venetian period. And I say likely, for it seems to form a match set with sarcophagus of Venus still in the main square of Famagusta. In a striking example of cultural hybridity, I would argue that the decorative swags on the Venetian fountain were inspired by those on the antique sarcophagus. Likewise, the heads that were clearly inserted into the ends of the sarcophagus were intended to coordinate with the fountain. It's yet another example of alighting the Roman past into the Venetian present, such as we saw with the Fontana della Pallada of Brescia. Now let's look at Candia, now Heraklion, uh, the principal city of Venetian Crete. Public and private wells and cisterns were already in use when the Venetians arrived on the island around 1210, uh, but they were insufficient for the needs of the population. So fresh water was hauled in from wells near Kazamba, around, around 15 meters east of the city. In 1474, the Venetian Senate observed the danger of the situation if the city should fall under siege by the Ottoman Turks and ordered the construction of three large cisterns to be built inside the city with all speed to store rainwater to supp supplement the water from Kazamba. Private parties were also ordered to restore and maintain their own cisterns. The wellheads now survive only in a museum, but they're remarkably similar to those in Venice. It was only in the 1550s that the first true aqueduct was built to bring in water from outside the city. It was constructed at the initiative of John Matteo Bembo, now Capitano of Candia. Frustrated in Cyprus, Bembo was ordered a second opportunity to demonstrate his hydraulic skills by constructing a conduit to supply a handsome new wall-type fountain in front of the Augustinian Monastery of San Salvatore. A pastiche of antique fragments and 16th century marble reliefs, the fountain celebrated the city's classical roots and Bembo's antiquarian expertise with a headless Roman statue of Asclepius on a plinth provided with a spout from which water flowed into an antique sarcophagus. That would be a, more of a, like a cinerary kind of urn. The statue is flanked by the coats of arms of Bembo and the Duke of Candia, with the friezes at the sides featuring San Marco and the arms of six Venetians who filled lesser offices in the city. Despite such efforts, Candia continued to suffer from periodic water shortages. When Francesco Morosini arrived as the new Provveditore Generale in 1625, he resolved to solve the problem once and for all. In collaboration with three engineers, he constructed a new aqueduct to bring high quality water from springs in the Euctus Mountains south of the city. The water flowed through 15 kilometers of conduits over three major water bridges into channels inside the city walls. 
These construction drawings show a remarkable sensitivity to the environment, kind of like a modern environmental impact study. The map, which meant it would have probably never have been built. <laughs> Uh, the massive project involved thousands of workers and cost 13,000 ducats, of which 7,000 came from local contributions. It was completed in only 14 months. In order to ensure its safe operation, Morosini ordered that anyone who damaged the aqueduct should be severely punished with imprisonment, forced labor, exile, and confiscation of property. It culminated in the new Morosini fountain in the main square. Zwane Papadopoli, a, a Cretan who once worked in the Venetian chancery in Candia, later described it as, quote, a most beautiful fountain with a statue of a gigante, a giant, in the finest marble, standing on a pedestal, bearing a halberd in his hand, and treading on a large dolphin, also in marble. Papadopoli's gigante was the figure of Neptune or Poseidon holding a trident. The statue disappeared after the fall of Crete to the Ottoman Turks in 1669, but what remains is still impressive. It now consists of an upper basin supported by four lions atop an octagonal pedestal, which stands inside an eight-lobed lower basin atop a three-step base. The water flows from the mouths of the lions, into the basin below. In accordance with Venetian twin ideals of convenience plus adornment in its public wellheads, the eight-lobe design was intended to facilitate access as much as possible. Each semicircle, or each lobe, allowed five persons to draw water at the same time, 40 in all. The theme of the lower basin is a marine theosos, Neptune's triumphal entourage of tritons, dolphins, nymphs, and other mythical sea creatures. The coats of arms of Morosini, the Venetian doge, the Duke of Candia, and his counselors are carved in the centers of each of the eight lobes. And what about those exuberant reliefs? Tritons struggling to restrain unruly hippocampuses or seahorses music making sea nymphs, on the left with a violin, on the right a trumpet. They are Italian in spirit, if not in execution. Where did the sculptors get their inspiration? Almost certainly from prints like those of Marco Dente's engravings after Raphael, which circulated widely even as far as the island of Crete, and offered a rich vocabulary of mythological sea creatures, enthusiastically reinterpreted with varying degrees of proficiency, by the sculptor Thomas Benetos and his brothers. But we shouldn't exclude the influence of the flagpole bases in Piazza San Marco, which the Cretan sculptors would in all likelihood never have seen. But their Venetian patrons would have known them well, an appropriate reference for the civic center of Candia, known as the other Venice in the, in the Mediterranean. In his final report to the Venetian Senate, Morosini proudly described the inauguration of the fountain by the Latin Archbishop on the, quote, on the day of our blessed protector San Marco, the 25th of April, 1628, unquote. Morosini decreed that the water, some 1,000 gallons a day, should remain public and could not be sold to private parties. Papadopoli later wrote, when the water was made to flow for the first time in this fountain, I remember clearly how great celebrations were held in the square. There were crowds of people and merriment and applause for the Provveditore Generale who had built the fountain and had the water brought in from the countryside. Oh, how the city rejoiced on that occasion. Morosini comm commemorated the event with his portrait medal featuring an image of the fountain on the reverse. Zeus, astride an eagle, pours water from an amphora and alludes to the source of the water, Mount Euctus, the legendary burial place of Zeus, whose profile was held to be seen in its ridgeline. The Latin inscription suggests that Zeus now celebrates with flowing water and not with a thunderbolt. For the figure of Neptune or Poseidon, there was by then a long tradition begun by Montorsoli with his Fountain of Neptune in Messina, completed in 1557. 
It was soon followed by Amanati's fountain for Cosimo de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany in Florence, that was still underway when John Bologna completed another one in Bologna, this of bronze. The figure's contraposto stance suggests that he was the direct model for the Neptune on Morosini's fountain, if the medal can be considered credible evidence. Returning to Candia and using a little artistic license in Morosini's commemorative medal, we may place Neptune atop his fountain. I love doing this kind of thing. <laughs> As the medal suggests, Neptune calms the waters, the source of Venice's and Crete's prosperity, and Zeus, or God, is the heavenly source of the rainwater that sustains human life, while the four lion water spouts symbolize Venice's role in making it available to the populace. The fountain thus embodied three intertwined themes, the power of God, the power of the sea, and the power of a triumphal Venice. Alas, after, in 1669, after a 24-year siege, Venice was not triumphant, and the island fell to the Ottoman Turks. They soon converted the nearby Basilica of St. Mark into a mosque, and eventually turned the civic fountain into an ablution fountain by drilling holes into the lobes of the lower basin and scooping out indentations in the base to allow for the water washing of the face, hands, and feet before Muslim prayer and in a sense turned the old Venetian civic center of Candia into the courtyard of the mosque. Now let's return to Venice in the 18th century, where water was still being hoisted up in buckets from the cisterns beneath the courtyards or brought in by barges. Repeated attempts had been made to drill proper wells over the years, all without producing drinkable water. An aqueduct under the lagoon was first proposed in the 15th century and again in the 16th, 17th, and 18th. Nothing happened. In 1841, the engineer Ignacio Michela proposed that an aqueduct could be built using the new railway bridge culminating in Piazza San Marco with a grandiose fountain crowned by a personification of Venice atop a rocky mountain. There is, Michaela wrote, no more pleasant spectacle than water gushing in great masses, and such an edifice would join utility to decoration. The ancient and magnificent square in Venice, so rightfully praised everywhere, would acquire a novel and worthy adornment. Well, after many fits and starts, in 1880, a French company finally undertook the project and in less than four years constructed an aqueduct 16 miles long to bring water from the Brenta River into the great Sant'Andrea cistern near Piazzale Roma. Still there, well, probably not the same one, but it's still there. Uh, the project was completed in 1884 and celebrated in a public inauguration by the erection of a fountain in front of San Marco. A modest, but alas, only temporary version of Michaela's project of four decades earlier. For a moment in time, Marine Sinudo's wish was fulfilled. Were it possible to make fountains here, I think that no city in the world would equal Venice. Piping was laid under bridges and pavement, and water eventually flowed out of spigots in or near the old wellheads. As the wealthier classes transitioned to running water from the private cisterns inside their courtyards, many of their elaborate wellheads went into public space to be enjoyed by rich and poor alike. This elegant example once adorned the central courtyard in Ca Corner de la Ca Grande on the Grand Canal. It was moved, complete with its base, to Campo San Giovanni e Paolo in 1884 and fitted up with a proper water spout. The wellhead itself was no longer for the convenience of the people, but still for the ornament of the city. Other wellheads became collector's items, traveling the world. Two modest pieces ended up behind the art museum on, on the Princeton campus, and a more impressive late medieval example is in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Four handsome specimens found their way to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and others to California. The newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst purchased this large wellhead in Verona in 1900 and gave it to his mother, Phoebe Apperson Hearst. 
She displayed it prominently at the entrance to her Pleasanton country estate, which she named La Hacienda del Pozo de Verona. After Phoebe's death in 1919, the wellhead was moved to the Old Hearst Castle at San Simeon and placed on the South Terrace. There it was joined by an impressive collection of other wellheads. One conveniently fitted up with a bucket suspended from a column of blue-green Cipollino marble. Yet other wellheads found their way to the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest, where they lined the sides of the Renaissance Hall. But some of these wandering wellheads were too good to be true. If originals were not to be had, counterfeiters set out to fill the void. This fine specimen is carved from pink Verona marble with elaborate relief decoration featuring palmettes and intertwined cantus scrolls, motifs that have a long history going back to the 12th century. But the wellhead is not medieval at all. It was carved in a Venetian workshop in the late 19th century for the export trade and not for domestic use. Nor was Peggy Guggenheim immune from the lure of the fake. This wellhead, decorated with medieval motifs in the Garden of the Guggenheim collection in Venice, is also a handsome forgery made in the same period. Replicas of the finest wellheads wrought by Venetian artisans of an earlier time were also available by mail order from this 1960 catalog, 16 catalog. On the left, smaller versions of the massive wellheads in the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducale. On the upper right, a rep reproduction of the wellhead in Campo San Giovanni e Paolo, and beneath it, a replica of one of the archaeological wellheads made from a Corinthian capital. All were available in terracotta, or for a price, in marble or Istrian stone. But originals are still to be had. This fine example would have been yours for little more than $10,000 in a Christie's sale in London in 2012. Now we've seen the vast aquatic reach of the Venetian Empire, extending from the fountains of Bergamo and Brescia in the west to the wellheads and fountains of the islands of the Mediterranean in the east, and to the genuine and fake wellheads that fill museums throughout Europe and the United States. Venice's political empire may have ended in 1797, but the city continued to dominate the imagination of an even larger world without boundaries. We might conclude that Venice, the city without water and without a proper fountain in the Piazza San Marco, had nonetheless triumphed, triumphed over adversity and made the entire world its virtual dominion. Thank you.